Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining SP Lagos section for this virtual technical meeting titled Managing Abandonment Issues in the Nigerian Oil and Gas Industry. This technical meeting will be facilitated by Dr. Kelechi Ojuko. This technical meeting is sponsored by Walter Smith Petroman. Before we proceed, I'd like to share with you some brief safety tips and virtual meeting etiquette. My name is Princess Ofo and I'm the publicity chair for SP Lagos section. We are in the era of COVID and it is necessary that we follow all the protocols to ensure that we keep ourselves healthy and safe. So wash your hands frequently. Use an alcohol based sanitizer. Endeavor to use a face mask, especially when out in public and try as much as possible to practice social distancing. Avoid large gatherings. And if you feel any COVID-19 symptoms, try to self-isolate. You can call NCDC if you're in Nigeria on the toll-free number just on your screen. It is my humble privilege to welcome our section chair, Mr. Michael Oyere, for his welcome remarks. Michael, over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Princess. OK, gives me pleasure today to yet again welcome everyone that is connected to this meeting. Um, it's a virtual technical meeting for the month of February, and we're excited to be partnering with um, Walter Smith and PetroSmart to deliver on this very interesting topic, managing abandonment issues in the Nigerian oil and gas industry. And we also like to welcome our partners to this technical event. We believe the MD of PetroSmart, Dr. Kelechi, will be sharing very valuable insights with us today on this topic, and we therefore urge you all to listen and participate very actively so as to benefit optimally from this presentation. Thank you for connecting, and on behalf of the Lagos section, I welcome you all once again to the February technical meeting. I will now yield the virtual floor back to Princess, what? our facilitator, to kick Thank off the presentation. Thank you, Princess. Over to you. Thank you very, very much, Michael. So the moment we have all been waiting for is now here. We have a very seasoned instructor that will be taking us on the topic, managing abandonment issues in the Nigerian oil and gas industry. Dr. Kelechi Ojuko, is a seasoned petroleum engineer with operator and service company profiles, including private and public sector experience. A Slum BJ Wireline and testing veteran of 1990, he had a rewarding international career spanning over 20 years across 14 different countries in Africa, Europe, Asia, Australia, and North America, and rose to principal reservoir engineer of Slum BJ for West and South Africa. Dr. Kelechi has also served on different boards of exploration and production companies. Dr. Kelechi holds a PhD in Petroleum Economics from Emerald Energy Institute, the University of Port Harcourt. He's a member of SPE, Society of Petroleum Engineers, NSE, IAEE, PEO, and a licensed engineer with dozens of paper publications under his belt, covering technical, commercial, and policy-related matters. He holds many technology patents in and outside the oil sector, and he enjoys mentoring, writing, traveling, jogging, and playing go. I welcome Dr. Kelechi to take us further on this very apt topic that is necessary, managing abandonment issues in the Nigerian oil and gas industry. Dr. Kelechi, please over to you. Thank you uh, very much for that humbling introduction. I'm going to share my slide. Can you see my slide? Yes. Yes, thank you. 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, my fellow SPE colleagues and esteemed guests. It's quite an honor to be granted the opportunity to make this presentation to you. Uh, I know that many of you may not uh, know me because I spent a third of my career career overseas. This is probably my first real life happening on the SPE Nigeria platform since coming back home with the exception of a few papers and views and committee work uh, that I've carried out in the past. And, I, and hopefully this won't be the last. Today I'm going to be speaking on an unusual topic in our industry, one which no operator really wants to talk about for obvious reasons, and that's because it doesn't make any revenues. So they would usually kick it further down the road or pass it on just like in a football or relay. I'm talking about something you all know as abandonment. I've written quite a lot on this subject. So the title of today's lecture is called Managing Abandonment Issues in Nigerian Oil and Gas Industry. Please know that this is an independent perspective and my expert opinion on the subject of asset retirement obligation, ARO in Nigeria. Petrosmart is an indigenous oil and gas services company with extensive experience covering operator and service company and a deeply rooted local presence. This is the outline of my presentation. I'm going to first look at a review of ARO from the legislative angle using Nigeria as a case study. And then subsequently, we're going to delve into the management of ARO in Nigeria. In accordance with the review of ARO, Nigeria's case study. Why ARO? Why are we here today talking about this unusual topic? Well, every EMP project has a finite lifetime comprising of 50 stages the exploration and appraisal, which is where we discover the oil and appraisal commerciality, then the development and production, which is when we drill up wells to ramp up production and then at 10 plus two and then produce it and sell it. And then finally, the abandonment, the commissioning and reclamation, which is when we turn out the life. The ARO is one link that connects the operator to government and the host community. I always like to start with the Brent Spa example. The ARO did not become a major issue in the oil and gas industry until the Brent Spa abandonment incident of 1995. Shell had a problem of having to dispose of this bond pro, uh, production uh, platform in the sea and planned to do that for 11 million pounds, which was about $16 million. Unfortunately, Shell was not allowed to do this due to large or uh, huge public, uh, public outcry in Europe, which uh, eventually meant that Shell had to spend $64 million to to actually dispose of this on land. That's $53 million more than Shell plan to abandon the Grand Spa. So that gives you an indication of uh, the extent of which they are both becomes very important for us to capture that huge cost. Just the difference that disposal of the platform meant to Shell, 82% of the cost uh, of the cost of this was purely based on the disposal. So what is ARO? First, let's dis, uh, define asset retirement in itself by Hoffman et al. As the permanent inactivation, removal, or closure of a petroleum asset by rendering it permanently inoperable, such as wells, pipelines, facilities, site restoration, and inflammation. Then we have asset retirement obligation, which is defined by Mackie as the unavoidable cost associated with safeguarding oil field by removing production equipment and restoring the environment back to its original state. ARO can be stratified into four main domain areas. The first one being the well plugging up, the well plugging and abandonment, and then the facility and infrastructure decommissioning. And then the other two that are quite unusual for us uh, in ARO is the environmental remediation, covering things like borough peaks, roads, river channels, and so on, and then site restoration, 
covering things like uh, oil spill, forestation, underground water contamination, and so on. ARO is viewed as the potential elephant in the room. Why? Because this, this uh, ARO is a life cycle environmental liability that can sometimes exceed terminal value unless it is carefully managed. Now, let's take, uh, take a look at this typical depletion cycle of an EMP project. You are familiar with this in the EMP business. Usually, you know, um, um, you declare your first oil and you bring up your wells and ramp up production to your plant to and stay there for a while, but not forever. Then it begins to decline and declines all the way to until you turn out the lights. So you'll find that most of the majors all over the world, not just in Nigeria, would at some point in the decline stage divest these assets, as you can see on the green on the green uh, star there. The green star is showing uh, depicting a case of 20% uh, recovery, where say they would decide to divest for any other reasons. This could be many reasons, but ARO is usually one of the reasons. And so this is not new in Nigeria, and it's not the case of uh, being, you know, favoring Nigerian companies or, or Christmas, uh, giving us a Christmas gift. It is an, it's a, it's a usual business as seen in many parts of the world. The only difference here is that the federal government of Nigeria has graciously made it mandatory for them to award most of this sales to indigenous players in order to increase uh, Nigerian partic indigenous participation in the industry. That's the key difference. But we, it's not unusual to see uh, a, a abandonment or ARO happen occur much earlier in the process. For example, we've seen in UK crop oil field in 1991, Hamilton Oil actually abandoned the field two years after first oil, and that was because of poor uh, prognosis of the risk of water commerce. So, when should we abandon an oil field? That's the big question. Today, we would say, we would easily go and say, you know, uh, or assume that sales revenue becomes uh, when sales of revenue becomes equal to economic limit. Well, let's take a look at this picture. Now, in a place like Grace Park case, the ARO quickly went from 11 or 16 million dollars to 64 million dollars. Just because a component of the ARO, one component alone. So, undermining or underestimating ARO can be of significant significance. So on top of this economic limit, which is where the sales level becomes equal to the operating cost, you have this, you know, ARO right there, summing up the time. So if you follow the red curve in a place like Nigeria, where we still in most in large case, in, you know, uh, uh, largely practice the terminal ARO philosophy, uh, it means that our terminal value currently will become, you know, equal to the terminal. Yeah. So if you take the curve where it cuts across the you know, if you have an abundance field there, you will be leaving a huge quantity of oil in the ground. And that is not desirable to the country or to the operator. So it will be difficult to convince anyone why you have to you know turn out the lights at that point. This is why we need to manage the so as you can see from the green uh, curve where we accrue the ARO at the beginning and begin to manage the process using some ARO provisioning so that by the end of the field uh, life, we, are, we not only extend the field life, but we recover more oil from the ground and then we'll be able to also minimize the uh, ARO at, uh, liability at the end of the field, uh, field life. So this is the reason why we need to do something about it. So significance of ARO. ARO will benefit the following institutions and bodies in Nigeria. The regulator, for example, mostly, where you know who should who hold the IOCs accountable for the ARO approval, monitoring and compliance. Also for asset divestment, which is where all the you know operators, mostly the IOCs, should be held accountable for their ARO liability before they exit the asset. And then the investors and operators. The government, the analyst buyers, the banks and financial institutions, the tax authorities, the tribunals, courts, and litigators, the Nigerian Stock Exchange and SEC, and the host communities. There are governing laws.
for AIRTO, all concessions and production sharing contracts share one thing in common, and that is with the commission the infrastructure and the claim decided at the end of the contract. There are national and international laws covering ARO for both Nigeria, inland, and territorial waters. I have listed, classified them under these four broad headings: the international legislation, which looks at uh, laws, international laws, of which Nigeria is a signatory to, and then Nigerian legislation, bilateral contractual agreements, and regulatory provisions. Starting with the international laws, first, national laws apply to anywhere on land, in the ground, in land, or beyond international law. Okay. So, applicable to Nigeria will be faced by the Continental Shelf Convention of 1958, the CSCT, which makes it mandatory to remove everything all the way to the seabed. And that is what Nigeria also currently practices. And then you have the later convention called the United Nations Law of the Sea Convention, UNCLOS 1982. Article 63 provides for partial removal, which is more realistic, but more far stringent because of the level of evidence required. This phone clause means that we need to at least be mindful of the navigation uh, environment and also the fishermen. Those are the, uh, uh, but at least partial removal is more uh, uh, um, realistic for the operators to embark upon. Then we have the Long Term Dumping Convention of 1972. This is non oil and gas specific, but caters for such things as toxic, um, toxic uh, chemicals and hazardous chemicals that are dangerous for the environment. The United legislations, all titles to onshore and nearshore petroleum activities are vested absolutely in the state. This includes land or water or submerged coastal. So the applicable laws in Nigeria today can, you know, start from the Petroleum Act of 1969, which vests it upon the, you know, the right of first refusal upon the honorable means of petroleum to, to either take over some of these assets by, their, um, by the time they apply for abandonment. And it also focuses on abandonment instead of ARO, as I pointed out. Now, you can see this as a kind of window or a leeway for some of the operators sometimes and gives you, know, gives you a kind of uh, um, uncertainty. And then the Petroleum Drilling and Production Regulations of 1969, which is again on clear ARO and does not provide the make the regulatory provisions available for administering and enforcing the ARO. And then you have the Petroleum Profit uh, Act of 1958 and the most recent update on the Financial Act of last year, 2020, which excludes ARO and also ARO costs for tax deductibility. On the bilateral contracts, we also have abandonment provisions in our bilateral contracts between the licensees and the state, including obligations to the surviving those communities. Take, for, for example, the decommissioning obligations we find in our PSC, which empowers the operator and not the regulator. And then we have the decommissioning obligations in our marginal field contracts, which is designed to protect the more from the family. So we, on the uh, community perspective, we are trying to promote the doctrine of promissory estoppel to be enshrined in the law to manage community issues as part of ARO in Nigeria. Now, what is this doctrine of promissory estoppel? Um, let's look at how it has been defined by, um, or cited in, by IMF by referencing the, the financial uh, Accounting Standards Board of the United States, which is the organization that oversees financial accounting in the United States and SEC. Section 42.2, and I quote, it reads, a legal ob uh, ob obligation can result from a, 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 a law, statute, or ordinance, B, an agreement between entities such as meeting or oral contract, or C, a promise conveyed to a third party that imposes a reasonable expectation of performance upon the promisor under the doctrine of promissory estoppel. Now we can see that if this is adopted in Nigeria, 
you know, it, it makes such agreements like the MOUs or GMOUs between the operator and the communities, you know, allowable as part of the ALO. And by so doing, it allows for this to be properly managed and operators to, to, to capture this properly in the accounting records. And then it will go a long way to enhancing the uh, relationship with the communities and minimizing the friction and uh, issues that we have with our community, those communities. On the regulatory provisions, there are non-binding guidelines to be considered by the operator when implementing the airport beyond the existing laws and contracts. We, for example, we have under the environmental guidelines what we call the environmental impact assessment. Every operator knows this. You have to get it from the EPR or the EER. And then under the regulatory guidelines, we have environmental guidelines and standards for the petroleum industry, EGASP in 2018. This document, uh, EGASP in 2018, has section part uh, 7 and 2.1 total removal all the way. And then we have the On the FIRS provisions, we don't find any tax incentive for ARO. And uh, according to IMS, a country's attractiveness depends on its tax recovery provisions. Best practices on tax, we are seeing the importance and relevance of provisioning in ARO, right from the first slide. And what is provision? A provision is an accounting entry that reduces the company's chargeable or accessible profits. Without the provision, there are no tax incentives for the operator. There are three common ones I have found. You can read some of that in my paper. Tax deduction on actual expenditures. We have seen in Brazil concessions, Australia, Denmark, Norway, UK, and Zambia. And then tax deduction as per provision where no cash is expensed. And this is uh, a practice in Netherlands. And then we have immediate tax deduction as per pre-funding, as we see in Brazil's PSC contracts, Ghana, India, Mozambique, Namibia, South Africa, and so on. Now, these are these ones on red, I highlighted them because they're African countries. I would consider them baby African countries you know, compared to the grandfather in the oil and gas business. So there is a an urgent case for action in Nigeria. And I would like to start from the reserves perspective. Nigeria's rate today, Nigeria's rate of daily production is seven times the rate of reserve addition as you can cite or you know, see from this extract from DPR annual report of 2018. It clearly indicates that the joint venture uh, production of 314 million barrels in 2018 wasn't only, you know, uh, you know the, the, that the reserve, rate of reserve replacement is only 15% of that. And that's quite infinitesimal compared to the production sharing contract of 110, or the marginal rate, of course, we know why, 167. So this is really, really shocking and begins to highlight what is happening on our JV assets. So it is a signal of eminent abandonment and retirement. So we must begin to get ready. For this. Then on the production perspective, there are at least 5,600 since nineteen eighty. We are discounting just the ones you know before the war and shortly after the war uh, to, to look at the, the ones we are most certain about. Okay, so this is conservative, out of which about 3,002 are reported to be uh, non producing so if we assume that, or rather, if we look at the records from DPR, which shows that 2,616 of, uh, of Nigerian oil wells are active out of this portfolio, from this portfolio, it, you know, it gives you an indication that these 2,616 might have produced the 2.12 million barrels uh, per day on the average that we saw in 2016, which translates to a reasonable average. You know, promising but still low for Nigerian oil well. Now, if we do a back of our general calculation, say we assume that 856 post 2010 wells 
are producing, say, 1,700 barrels of oil per day on the average. Let's make that assumption because this is a reasonable assumption. Then the remaining older wells, 1,760 of them, should be making about 375 barrels of oil per day per well. Now, that is shocking again. That is revealing something. And that is a tragic situation because when you start getting these kind of numbers, most production technologies will tell you that um, it's in Nigeria. So what does this imply? That about 3,760 wells in Nigeria today may be likely due for retirement. And that is if we assume that there are additional 2,000 wells of the 3,000 that are shopping added to this basket. So that is something we need to be very, very mindful about. Nigeria's CFO liability. We know that at least we have about 583 oil fields in Nigeria. And if we assume that we have 292 facilities for them in Nigeria today, we know that we have from Peter Smart research findings that the AIO liability of Nigeria is as big as 15 billion uh, US dollars. Now, this is a big, big number for Nigeria as an exposure. So, but Nigeria's 2009 oil revenue was only 3.9 billion, say so $4 billion. So, how are we planning to offset this huge and looming liability? This is quite, you know, uh, a big number, considering that our budget for the same year was around $11.7 billion. So, even if we are going to take money from the budget to do this, uh, I don't think it may receive any approval. So, it is from this $4 billion that we expect to cover out the cash to take care of this uh, liability eventually. And that means it might take 10 to 30 years if we started if we have to start now. So there is a big need for AIO regulation in Nigeria. First and foremost, it's very important in order for us to arrest and control the exposure of the Nigerian government. And then to avoid the delays in compliance, since abandonment is not a revenue generating activity, as we know now. And to manage retirement proactively in order to avoid some of the tax sources that might have you know, appear when we get to abandonment, nobody will pay it again to the government. That's not nice. And then it will also open up, likely open up a new service industry that we don't have to pay, that's the abandonment industry, as we have in other countries. And then to extend the field of life, thereby maximizing oil and gas recovery and mitigation. And to enhance or an energy relationship we have with the host communities and the environment. And then it seeks to comply with international treaties that we have signed. And then the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goal 2030. And to incentivize operators and protect the government's interest. And finally, to improve Nigeria's attractiveness to foreign investors. So, I have made some recommendations. First and foremost, the, one, the, the, fourth, the, the most important one is the paradigm For us to change our mindset from abandonment mindset to air implementation. This is very important. We are not late here. We are not the only ones. Australia only started a few years back. So, most countries are waking up to this new reality in oil and gas. And it's been exacerbated also by the uh, energy transition that we all have to face. So, there is a legal obligation that should be clarified, including the role of the uh, regulator and the independent third parties. There's also a regulation of we need to Um, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? We can hear you, Dr. Oduko. Can you still see my slide? Yes, the slides are visible. Okay, something happened that cannot be. Okay. 
your your slides are okay. on the recommendation. Uh, um, slide is not visible anymore. Okay, can you see my slide? Can you see it now? It's coming up. Okay, it's up okay. now. Sorry about Okay, so I'll, re I'll repeat number four. So we have the um, the home plus 1982, which Article 60 of it provides for um, that you know, it needs to be gazetted for offshore compliance. If, if that has not already been done, we re recommend that it's done. And they will put the head accountable for their AFO liability before and after existing, existing their assets. The fact that they have existed assets does not mean that they should be able to walk away from this binding law of uh, liability. And then to include the doctrine of promise is to fail to enhance relationships with surviving communities. And then finally, to ensure that our PIB is updated to incorporate some of the core principles of care of the community. Now we're going to go into the managing of air for in Nigeria. Here is a depiction of the upstream petroleum fiscal arrangement in Nigeria today, covering the concession and the contract. As you can see, some of the common ones we are familiar with are the sole risk, the joint venture, and the PSC. These are the common ones. And many of these, uh, the, you know, we always believe that there is uh, zero government risk in the PSC and so on, because the, the contracts are characterized by the government level of government ownership, government control, and government risk, as you can see here. So, right. so the fact that government risk in the PSCs and so on is, is, uh, is not, it doesn't mean that the ARO is also zero. It's not. There is still, government is still liable for the ARO. More important, if it becomes something called, you know, uh, regulating solvent. Which is when the IOCs walk away from the assets and investing in business companies, and eventually the business companies are unable to take care of this um, this huge liability. Don't forget that uh, the same has already left the station for some of these indigenous companies, and we have to figure out what is actually our air liability and where are we on the curve? Are we at the red spot, uh, red star, or are we on the or, or are we still in the green star? And we know that 80% of Nigeria's production today comes from mainly the JVs and the PSC. And since government owns from 55 to 60% of the JVs and 100% of the PSC, at least 60% of the currently accrued PSO can be assumed to be attributed to the government. And most of the JV assets currently producing over for the next five years, uh, uh, producing for 50 years or more, should be approaching their end of life retirement as well, as we have seen. Therefore, the JP exposure of our government today can currently be estimated to exceed $9 billion. What are the implications of ARO for Nigeria? I'd like to start from the government exposure, which we have seen can be very huge, probably uh, bigger than estimated. And this is necessary for us to prevent and avoid regulating sovereignty. Regulatory issues come next. You know, to make sure that we are able to monitor this AFO and monitor the operators, and then for compliance as well. And then management issues to ensure there is a third-party unbiased estimation of the of the AFO itself as the liability and as true. The approval has to be managed. Approval is a process on its own. And then fiscal and financial relief to ensure equity and also to make sure that there is some tax deductibility as an incentive. And then, of course, what we are trying to inject or promote the community and environmental concerns, which can be alleviated or at least minimized using by adopting the principle or the doctrine of promise free as to tell as defined. And then we need to update our technologies in line with global best practices. I'm going to touch on this a little bit on some of the technologies that we have on provide. And then to improve Nigeria's attractiveness overall because this is good for investment. We would like to see Nigeria where it is at the moment, ranked 12 by IMF in comparison of other relevant producing third world countries. 
where countries like Equatorial Guinea is up there, number four, and Angola is number one. Uh, we need to improve this picture. So, here are all management principles. There are about five frame, you know, there are all frameworks, management frameworks that you know that we need to put in place to attain a comprehensive air for management. The first one is the legal and fiscal framework, then regulatory framework, financial framework, technical framework, and then environmental and community framework. Then we have the key drivers for operators to consider when developing any air strategy, such as regulatory compliance, environmental compliance, HAC policy, economic and financial benefits, company reputation, and then companies, corporate objectives, and CSR. Here is the depiction of DPRs or an extra from DPRs for the parliament diet. On the left hand side, you can see that this is inadequate. Although you can see also that all the elements and best and of what we need have been captured and where they're missing because DPR has managed in one way or another. All the things is not desired to be, to be done. In this case, we look at things like flood and abandoned downhole according to permit criteria, or isolate production interval to prevent communication between aquifers of different nature. I see it as you know, um, you know, vague and inadequate. But on the right hand side, you can see um, a procedure that has been approved by the DPR. For SPDC. This was published by Charles Odita uh, in 2004, in 2004 as an SPD paper. And it clearly shows some clearer definition of specification for this abandonment, where the flood has to be set and so on. However, it's still inadequate because it doesn't say, it doesn't clarify on what happens or how do we actually see the the well, uh, how do we call the casing, where do we call the casing, and how do we leave the tubing downhole and so on. Uh, and so, you know, how do we leave the the seller, how do we get rid of everything from that wellhead, uh, and so on. So the details need to be uh, worked out. And from what I have seen also, you have, we have seen different abandonment uh, standards in Shell and different different, uh, different ones in Exxon Mobil and Chevron and so on. So we, we find that IOC is the one defining the standards for approval, and the standards are different, unlike other places in the world where this is well properly uh, uh, regulated. So, so what we like to do is, where, you know, see a situation where the regulator plays the music and while the operator dance to it and not the other way around. So there are some key questions for everyone, the operators and the regulators. One, when, to ab when do we abandon a field or well? What and how to abandon or remove? What other options are available? For instance, uh, can we reuse some of, the, some of these wells or facilities? What, who is responsible for it? How much will it cost? When does it accrue? And are there any financial com and compliance regulations? Managing ASO liability. There are five regulatory layers in ASO management. The first and foremost is the liability assessment itself or estimation, and then accrual, and then ASO management and provisioning and then compliance, monitoring, and, and finally enforcement. On the liability assessment, you can see that it is not that straightforward. It can be split into three major categories. Abandonment liability itself, which is focusing on the wells, and, you know, wells uh, abandonment, and then the commissioning liability, which is focusing on the facility, and then the reclamation liability. This reclamation can be very huge. So made an 82 percent share additional 53 million. That is on the decommissioning liability, let alone the reclamation. So, so there are two categories. It's not just enough to say we'll take away the, you know, remove the flow station and, and it's all over. No, I think there's a whole lot more here, like satellite manifolds, um, 
um, we need to remove uh, things like river, you know, where there is uh, structures and installations or communication towers and things like that that we have to remove. Uh, they add to the cost. Even things like soil treatment, animal rehabilitation, tree planting. It depends on how that environment was met and what the government specifies should be um, how it can be found in the original state. A conventional abandonment can be quite unnecessarily expensive. And the high cost is usually associated with the need to mobilize oil rigs. So, so the, this can compete very much with, because it's competing very much with the same rig and operator hand that we need to create productive wells. You know, it's very difficult to make a justification as to why you have to spend all this money, use your rig to go and abandon what's supposed to uh, drilling, uh, using wells, especially for independent and marginal field operators. And we know that Niger many of the Nigerians abandoned or closing wells today. That integrity uh, issue is, is very major. And uh, most of these wells, you don't even understand their current work condition for integrity. So you cannot end the NSA wells to abandon it unless you understand the work condition and so on. So it's a bit of a challenge. And the more we let this loom, the more the problems amount. Then they are not, the current cement blocks that we use are not quite permanent. You know, they can fairly and they're not as effective as the latest technologies because they last to about 3,000 PSI. You know, the latest technologies, they are easier to deploy, they cost more cost, they cost cheaper, they are more effective, and they can be longer lasting. So I'm going to, that takes us to now the, some of the uh, these are petro smart and the technology, the technology to uh, illustrate. Starting with our novel technologies. Well, we have the well abandonment resin flood technology, which is uh, patented by our partner in Canada, WPM. This is a proprietary formulation for absolute abandonment, replacing the conventional cement blocks. It can achieve high integrity of more than 3,000 PSI and a good, you know, very reliable over thousands of years. This technology is a game changer in the oil field abandonment track and has been approved in Canada and PetroSmart recommends this to be looked into for adoption in Nigeria as well. And then our right way rigless deployment tool. Again, a proprietary technology to WPM, our partner. It's established in Abata already as a rigless and cost effective method of abandonment. Quick and easy, deployment with, deployed uh, without the rig. We can also provide this to us. Both technologies provide a small susceptible downhole abandonment system up to 40% savings and reduction in uh, uh, CO2 emission. So the right way technology provides a cost effective superior alternative to cement uh, cement blocks because it has zero permeability and porosity, extended longevity, uh, longevity and endurance, no shrinkage issues, zero micro animals, cheaper than conventional company cement. And very high compressibility up to 20 centimeter of this was taken in the lab in the yard uh, to up to 57,000 psi. And it did not fail. What failed was the pipe that it was uh, sealed into that actually bent that we formed. Okay. Um, so, right way technology um, is much better than our conventional systems. Because it's simple and safer to deploy, more effective, faster and reliable, economical, both in material and cost, and minimum uh, equipment and personnel required. So you just simply assemble, load, deploy, and work with. I will show a clip of this you know, of, of illustration after this. So here are some of our uh, site services. You know, the facility before and after was removed. We don't just stop at abandonment, we provide well site and pipeline reclamation as well. And here is the case of site reclamation and road limitation in environmental safety limitation. And this is a case of reclamation of a pipeline and of course the riser. And opportunity for diversity of images when we do this and remove some of this facility and provide an opportunity for the to go to my So our scope of related services, we provide the following services in relation to air such as commercial and legal services on air matter, technical evaluation of air and aspect evaluation, management and monitoring of air 
Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, can you so, repeat the key? Over to you now. Okay. Dr. Kelechi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, um, can you retake the clip you played because we were seeing your PDF I can hear you. file. Yes, so we were seeing your PDF file on the capability. We didn't see the clip you were showing. Can you see this now? Yes, yes. Can you see what? Can you see it now? Oh, okay. So this is the right way to. The lesson has been filled into the right way to. And then it's now been released into the into the well. 
And uh, if we did the plot that is already set in the well, Thank you very much, Dr. Kilichi. That was a very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you. So, Dr. Kilichi has Dr. Kilichi has showed us. dollars to about sixty four million dollars. if ignored. Now he he also went through during his presentation he talked international law and the local legislations that are applicable to the Nigerian environment. He also seven times more than the rate of reserves and this shows that abandonment and retirement is imminent according to Dr. Kilichi and he also stated the liability of up to 15.08 billion for the Nigerian government and did the comparison with our current oil revenue and even budget showing that the financial implications could run for years if we do not start implementing it. And he has stated that there are reasons for ARO obligations. That is to arrest and control the exposure to Nigerian government to also ensure compliance when it comes to the regulatory provisions. And especially that for IOCs, when divesting assets, they must ensure that they also are held accountable for the assets, retirement obligation liabilities. Now, he also made it clear that even though the non the government risks 
seems to be low or non-existent for PSAs, there is still the ARO, there is still the ARO liability. He has talked about the implications for Nigeria, the government exposure, the fiscal and, and financial relief, community and environment concerns. And he has also listed out the frameworks, the compliance, the policies, and the drivers for asset retirement obligations. He put a quick cursory look on the DPR well abandonment guideline and also stated that the details must be fine tuned, not necessarily a case where the IOCs define the different standards, but rather the regulators will harmonize the standard and ensure that it is followed by the IOCs and every other industry player. He has asked certain key questions that must be considered and also let us in on the regulatory layers in ARO. And then he has told us the different facets of the asset retirement obligation liability when it comes to the well plugging and abandonment, facility decommissioning, environmental remediation. And just as he has mentioned, it is an elephant that must be well dealt with. He has also gone ahead to show us what PetroSmart is doing in terms of the right way technology that offers a safe, effective and reliable means for abandonment uh, in comparison to the conventional cement plug. So that is just a brief highlight of some of the things that Dr. Kelechi has talked about. And would you have questions on this particular subject? Please type it in the chat box and then we would respond to it. So. OK, so Dr. Kelechi, I will read out the, the a lot of questions have come in and I will read out the questions so that you can respond to them. So we have a question from Istifa. Istifa says IOCs divest their wealth stock to, to indigenous companies and so waive their liabilities over ARO costs, correct? If yes, are the new asset operators well aware and committed to ARO and will the government enforce this? I can't, uh, I can't hear you. Right. Okay, the, there is a question from Ms. Tifa that says that the IOC is divest. Yes, doctor, I can hear you. Now I can hear you. Go ahead again. Okay. What so, is the question? Okay. So is Tifa um, asked the question? Um, I can't hear you. Maybe I don't know what that is. Okay. Let me let me try and repeat myself. Can you hear me, Doctor? I can hear you now. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. I think it's uh, a bit of uh, <laughs> in Yes, it must be uh, interference. OK, so we have a question from Ms. Tifa that says, IOCs divest their wealth stock to indigenous companies and so waive their liabilities over ARO costs, right? If yes, are the new asset operators well aware and committed to ARO? And will the government enforce it? Mm -hmm. Istifa wants to know if, you know, when the assets are divested, if the new asset operators are aware and will be able to commit to the ARUs and will the government enforce it? Um, I didn't quite get that question. You're asking whether the government can enforce the ARO if it is implemented? When when the assets are divested, are the new asset operators aware of the asset retirement 
um, obligations when they are divested uh, by the IOCs and you now have new asset operators? Yeah. Are they aware? Is that the question? Any other thing? Are they aware and will the government that, enforce that all the questions? And will the government enforce their commitment to the ARO for the new asset operators? Okay, thank you. Thanks for that question. I hope you're able to hear me clearly because you were great. Now um, yes, um, they are aware of abandonment um, liability. Usually, when uh, IOCs divest assets, almost most uh, most companies that end up buying these assets at the outset, when they run their economics, they always factor in abandonment. It's a standard practice on economics. You have to factor in an abandonment. But the practice that we we see here is whereby abandonment is um, Factored in towards the end of the well life. And it's abandonment and not the ARO that we're talking about here. So, in, in, in eventually, they actually acquire this by and underestimate the level of ARO in the asset. And um, in many cases, I've seen it is actually the IOC, the divest. The, the seller that specifies what they think the, the, the uh, of, uh, abandonment obligation is not here for abandonment obligation. So, what we would like to see is where the, the government is taking the lead through the regulator to specify and estimate, make sure this is properly estimated and we know the exact amount. We would, we would like to see where a case where all the assets in Nigeria today, all the assets in Nigeria today, are uh, well estimated and approved, and we know how all the companies are managing their portfolio on month to month and year to year basis. But that is not the case. So they buy the asset, the moment they buy the asset, that's game over. The moment the, the asset, the, the transaction is approved by the government, by the minister, they take over the asset, no matter how they run the economy, nobody really pays attention to that aspect aspect of the transaction. What we pay attention to is the acquisition cost. So if you say, let's take a, you know, an example of a case where an asset has been divested for $2 billion and the, the ARO liability is say $500 uh, million. Now, it, should, it, it wouldn't have been um, possible for the government under a regulated environment to let that transaction close without that liability of $500 be, being offset either by the, by the uh, existing party or by the uh, new buyer. So unfortunately, we, we, allow, we allow these transactions to go at the moment. But what I'm trying to say is that having, looking at the past and looking at the vulnerability of the third party, uh, what I call end-life operators, because that's really what they are, they're end-life operators. Um, we need the government needs to step in and make sure that the latest ARO um, as obliged to by the operators that the latest ARO is also taken care of. That these operators, even though they resisted their failure, we put them accountable for the ARO that that they are good before that. Otherwise, it is difficult for this IOC uh, for this independence to take care of this huge cost. I don't know if I answered your question correctly. Yes, I, I believe that answers the question. So we also have other questions in the chat box. Um, someone is asking, what is the maximum temperature tolerance of the right way technology? Um, maximum temperature. Um, I'm afraid I would have to get that information for you. If you'd like to drop, drop me your contact details, we'll get, get that to you by tomorrow. OK, so, um, so whoever asks that question, you, you can just reach out via splagos.gmail.com and we would uh, create that contact. 
there is also a question about whether so uh, I was is, going to say something on the right way temperature. Uh, okay, please go ahead, sir. All right. Now, the tool itself, the right way tool itself, the plumbing tool, of course, can attain very high temperatures. What is important is the setting temperature, the environmental temperature for the resin technology. Resin can apply widening oil in the same time. It's just that this particular resin has certain qualities that uh, makes it suitable for setting environment. So we'll get you the environment, the maximum temperature, if you can leave your contact for the resin. Okay, thank you, Doctor. So we have another question that says, does the proposed PIB not cover abandonment regulations? It does. Um, yes, the proposed PIB, um, fortunately, does address, uh, it does address uh, abandonment. Again, it is still in the abandonment mindset. Okay, so does it address abandonment? Yes, quite better than before. And I was happy to see that. However, a lot still needs to be done to tidy it up. A lot, a whole lot. We need to at least, uh, like I said, you know, migrate to the mindset of, of ARO, looking at the brain path case, where just the disposal alone, okay, hiding the cost from 11, uh, $16 million dollars $54 million. That's about $53 million increase. So we need to start thinking more of ARO, and that has not been taken care of in the current PIP. We also see other things, you know, um, more, for example, the lack of regulatory cohesion and the, 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 the emphasis on terminal ARO or upfront cash you know, um, ARO, which are things we know that may not be the most suitable for Nigeria today under current circumstances and may be difficult to enforce. And then the account management, not too different from what we have in some of our PSCs, but yet they were not implemented. But say we, we choose to go that way, let's choose it um, by reviewing the other more attractive and more incentive, you know, providing more incentives. Uh, the operator and also making sure that there is a regulatory mechanism to estimate it, to accrue it, to monitor it, and to enforce it. That is key. That is again missing from the draft PIP and, and much more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have What's a question. Yes, you have already um, alluded that, you know, there is so much more that the PIB has to cover in terms of the abandonment regulations, how to accrue it and all the necessary, you know, guidelines. And I believe that can also be picked up from the recommendations that you made during your presentation and how it is something that we must focus on because um, it's a liability that will be picked up even as uh, many of our wells are nearing uh, the abandonment phase. So we have a question that says, uh, would you conclude that the financial risk for the government in JV abandonment is largely responsible for delays in asset retirement approval? Now, let's take, for example, I would like to start with, you know, 
associating the government as a as a party to the JV transact you know licenses where the government itself is taking risk and also sharing sharing risk and sharing uh, ownership. Okay, so in those JVs, the government happens to be one of the licensees, so it becomes a revolving cycle, and it's likely so because it's the majority partner there. And then the PSC is the owner, it's the full owner. So um, the government has to ensure that it reduces its own exposure by virtue of its ownership in this uh, in this asset. So the law mandates the, the licensees, but the licensees mandate the operator. So the operator needs to do this on behalf of the licensees, or on behalf of the partners. And that is where the regulator must act. Then we we see the delays. The delays are simple. Uh, nobody wants to spend a lot of money abandoning fields in a place where, unless it's being forced to do that or related to do that, something has to happen. And I can give you instances in, in developed countries. But um, that's the to be that these operators have always seen, the, you know, it's a case of robbing Peter to pay for. We operate a field. Uh, development environment, no well development environment. And in this field development environment, in a, an oil block with several fields, while one field might be uh, due for retirement, another field is upcoming and the same facility becomes shared. So, so you see a case where operation continues to go on on that of oil uh, block, but these certain fields there are already due for retirement and being ignored. And, and that is what we are seeing. However, if we implement ARO, these this inadequacies become apparent to the regulator because there will be independent monitoring of these operators. I will be able to run them and be able to detect their, their, their uh, liability level um, on the other basis. So, say an independent operator has huge liability in Canada. Nobody will go to buy that asset. You have seen cases where we have to buy an oil field in Canada. And that's because the liability has exceeded the standard of because you are buying a liability, and when you buy it, you go and uh, manage the, you know, seed the chaff from, from, the, from the oil, and then select use, reusable fields that you can put to production by doing some work over on them, and then abandon the ones half of the portfolio that is good for, that, that cannot be reused. But in, the, in that case, you can actually make money based on the liability on the field because the, 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 the uh, sellers must not be allowed to exit there without putting that money down somehow. So that is the case in Nigeria. We see these delays. Uh, it's almost like hitting the, uh, hitting the, the, the can down the road. Nobody really wants to face it. And um, by the time they realize it's getting to the time of uh, retirement, they will always exit the asset, sell it to end life of the This is not the case we are seeing. This is happening all over the world. There's one thing that's going to be done. Yes, and we, you know, this you is okay. yes, yes, I am. So this is a very interesting topic because we have a lot of questions coming, some of which we may not be able to take within this time frame, but I'll try to read out the others we have. Um, so Timmy is asking whether DPR can enforce the abandonment plan um, as a mandatory part of the fuel development plan. Do you think that DPR can enforce this? Yes, I think that DPR can enforce this. I, I had the um, fuel development plan. Did you say fuel development plan? Yes. yes, so he asked, um, that that? Okay, so here is Timmy's question that the abandonment plan is now a mandatory part of fuel development plan requested by DPR. How do you think DPR can enforce these plans? I 
I don't want to end up with that very clearly. Can you please once more try to repeat that question or type it out for me? Okay. So, how can I, DPR enforce? I, I hear it in a bit some pieces. Yeah. yeah. So how can DPR enforce abandonment plan, which is now a mandatory part of field development plan that is requested by DPR? If, if your connection is uh, uh, quite, uh, uh, it's complicated, but I, I post abandonment through implementation of approval of FDP. Is that correct? Yes. Is that correct? Yes, doctor, that's correct. Okay, I, I didn't hear you, but let me say this. Okay, now, field development plan is focused on development, just by virtue of the We should start making a field abandonment plan. Of course, it's imperative that we should make a field abandonment plan because we're required to do that by law. But DPR, as a regulator, can decide to make a decision on how this can be implemented, either as part of the field development plan or not. However, the most important thing for us to acknowledge is, is the huge liability and the gaps that exist in our legislative framework. We also need to recognize the the extent to which DPR has tried to put provisions where no law exists and make sure that we have guidelines and regulate, you know, put things in place. So what is lacking is the next step, which is to actually enforce uh, um, uh, things like you know, a, a provisioning mechanism, a provisioning system. How do we go from a I'll give you an example. The wells like the AIO accrued should accrue from the day you fill that well. So it is not something you leave to the end of the fill fill life. The well that has been drilled today becomes um, the operator of that well, the owners of that well become liable for its AIO from that day going forward. So money so at every time in our uh, E and P life cycle either as a company or as a government. The regulator needs to know what the whole liability of on that day. So that is where we should start from. As there has been in the past, after the benchmark incident, um, um, government of companies to, to submit a plan, for example. It happened in Nigeria, it has been from 25 years ago, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. But that exercise, not many of the operators responded in time, but Shell did. And some of these companies were actually looking at wells that were due for retirement. Wells, not even fields. I doubt if Nigeria has abandoned any fields today. So even those wells that are due for retirement, it just shows you how, how, um, how different we are operating you know, in comparison to other countries that, that have uh, taken a, a bigger step forward in this area of oil and gas management. Which means that we need to actually start accruing from the day. That means Nigeria should recognize all AIO that exists today. We should assess all oil companies, not just by their production and performance. Part of the key performance index should be their liability and how they are managing it. In accordance with the law and the provision by the, regu by the regulator, to make provision for that amount, whether it is to put the money aside in the bank or whatever, or to account make a provision like in the Netherlands without cash, whatever that is guaranteed by the bank or whatever we decide to implement as a system by the government, the regulators should make selection of that and uh, enforce it. It can be done. At the moment, it's, it's, um, it's open and uh, what, what we are yet to see is cases where an operator exists an asset, yes, uh, and um, whether or not they abandon it. But my concern is how are they going to do that? From where are they going to be? The money is going to do that unless we clearly specify what it is to make. Otherwise, they'll walk away with very little investment uh, to reclaim the land. And we'll be left with huge 
huge community uproar and huge community liabilities, which will not be very good. Everywhere the multinationals operate around the world in digital countries today, and this is our primary obligation on their own. So Nigeria should not be the difference. Thank you, Doctor. So we will just take a final question. Um, just can you clarify on the difference? Is there a difference between abandonment liability and asset retirement liability? And we would take other questions uh, outside of this uh, webinar. Or please just uh, can you close with that clarity? Thank you. Yes, that's a very good question. I think I started my first slide trying to also highlight on that as, um, you know, uh, and ended up saying my recommendation is for us to shift from um, abandonment mindset to error mindset, which is, which is just basically saying we should add to our consideration for abandoning oil wells and abandoning uh, facilities to as much as Declamation. That includes restoration and reclamation. So um, we need to, to look at how to restore and how to reclaim the land, the site. And then, even as we go into the area of abandonment of wells themselves, we need to look closely as to how exactly do we achieve this. What are the standards? What are the specifications? And in a, an environment where the guideline says you should remove everything because we are signed to that treaty, the CSC uh, 1958, well, but also signed to the 1982 UNCLOS. So we need to make sure that these laws are not just guidelines, that they are binding laws to the operator that is clear what they need to do. They cannot just do whatever, plug the well, and say they've abandoned it and move on. No. There needs to be more, you know, specifications as to how you abandon that area so that nobody comes there 10 years from now and sees that there was an oil well there. That's what original means. So those elements of the area, they are currently missing. Okay. And, and that can be a huge cost difference, as we have seen. Thank you very much, Doctor. So this brings us to the end of the Q&A session on the topic, managing abandonment issues in the oil and gas industry. And if there is any take home, is that there is an urgent case for action and we should shift from the mindset of just abandonment to the asset retirement uh, obligations so that we can manage that and reduce all the exposures both to the Nigerian government and also understand that the uh, compliance must be enforced for operators when they are divesting assets. So we'll progress further to the section updates and announcements. And SP Lagos section, since the year 2021 began, we have organized uh, a lot of activities that are geared around our member development. And in the month of February, we began with uh, our board meeting and we also organized our webinars, webinars that are meant to help our, our members and also non-members that join us to get a bit of clarity on their goals for the year, how to achieve 360 degree personal finance, even in times like this, how to meet their health goals and how to get ahead in 2021 and beyond. We have also held uh, various trainings, especially for young professionals, and we are thankful to Slum BJ, who has Slum BJ Next, who has sponsored uh, some of these trainings. We had a technical training on high resolution and advanced reservoir simulation. We also held a vision board event. Now looking ahead, we have an upcoming training for anyone who wants to start a business, especially with a focus on the Nigerian oil and gas industry. So we have that entrepreneurship training coming up on Saturday, February 27 
and the information has been sent via emails and also on our social media. So please do well to register as there are only 50 seats available and it's on a first come first serve basis. We have a three day training on introduction to web application and development using PHP. We also have a diversity and inclusion event for students titled Preparing Tomorrow's Energy Leaders. The role of diversity inclusion in technology advancement, and that is for March 13th and 14th, 2021. We also have another event for March 25th, Closing the Gap, Promoting Diversity and Inclusion in the Oil and Gas Industry. We have a technical meeting. It's virtual also for March, and it's titled Signatures of a Horizontal Well Completed Near a Ceiling Boundary. And this will be facilitated by Professor Steve Adewole. So we have also included some snapshot of the events that we have. And please take note of our upcoming events so that you can be a part of it. So this just uh, on the screen, this was a snapshot from the webinars on getting ahead, the trainings, the vision board, and we have lots of events that have been planned. So please do well to take part in all of these webinars and events that have been planned for the personal and professional development of our members. Now, where can you find SP Lagos section? You can find us on various social media handles, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, Facebook and on YouTube. And would you have any inquiries on becoming a member or renewing your membership? There are various contact details right on the screen that you can call or send an email. And just in case you had uh, more questions from today's webinar that has not been answered, please do well to send an email to splagos at gmail.com and we would ensure that you know we get the answers even from our distinguished uh, instructor today. So that said, we want to thank every single person, especially our sponsors, Walter Smith Petroman Oil Limited for sponsoring today's technical meeting. We also want to thank Dr. Kelechi Ojuku for giving us a very insightful presentation on an app topic that must be considered and well planned for. We're also thankful to PetroSmart Group we're thankful to you, our audience, who have joined us from various locations ac across the globe and also engaged by asking very interactive sections. We ask that you stay abreast of planned activities. You can catch up on other activities that I've held even on our YouTube page and you can get access to them. And would you have any inquiries, please feel free to reach out to us. So with that said, we ask that you have a very wonderful day keep safe, stay um, COVID-19 uh, protocols compliant, and then have a wonderful day. Thank you very much.